Hey everybody, this little thing is the Insta360 GO 2. And if you're looking for a camera to capture your cycling fun, then it has some things that make it really easy to recommend and some that make it a bit of a pain. And based on my experience of using this camera, I'm gonna talk you through the pros and cons in this video. This isn't gonna be one of those videos where I tell you about how every single thing works. There are loads of those on YouTube already, if that's what you're after. This is specifically about using the GoTo for cycling based on my experiences of using it on a week's cycling holiday in Southern Spain, which incidentally, I can very much recommend. Here is a 20 second supercut of the holiday, all shot on the GoTo. Let's go to that. Looked good, didn't it? It was. Now, the first thing you'll have noticed about the GoTo is that it is tiny. I mean, really tiny. Full disclosure here, I have really big hands. But look at it, it weighs basically nothing. For reference, here it is next to a normal size GoPro Hero 8 Black. It's just minuscule. At some point in this video, I'll probably run out of words that mean small. For a camera that is so small, the picture is really good. The GoTo can record in 1440p, 50 frames per second, with a bit rate of up to 80 megabits per second, and you get 120 frames per second in slow-mo and full HD. On top of that, you get Insta360's image stabilization and horizon leveling. The camera actually shoots a file with a full field of view visible, so the actual file that comes out of the camera looks like this. This means you have to do some processing on the files after shooting to get what you want which, like a lot of things with the GoTo, is both a blessing and a curse. More on that in a bit. The diminutive camera isn't all you get. You also get this, which is a case that also doubles as a controller, which also doubles as an extra battery, which also doubles as a wireless connection to your phone. So basically, it's the rest of the camera. The two bits clip together using a magnetic connection. And you can magnet the camera to other things too. Uh, there's a magnet holder that has a GoPro mount, that I used for a lot of the POV stuff I shot. I, I stuck the mount that Insta360 supplied to the bottom of my out front hammerhead mount, and that worked a treat. There's a threaded one too, which you can put on the end of Insta360's excellent selfie stick, and these two mounts worked really well. The others are a bit less effective. You get a pendant one, which you can wear under a shirt. It's just a magnetic base, so you can stick the camera to your body. I mean, it's okay walking about town, but it doesn't really work so well on the bike, on your chest, because your chest is pointing down at the floor a lot of the time. I did put it on my sleeve, uh, that kind of worked, although it wasn't any more effective really than the out front mount, and it felt a bit more risky because the magnet connection just isn't that strong. The other one is this mount that has a sticky pad on the bottom and a universal joint. Now, this worked really well when I stuck it on the plane window to get this flying shot, and it also worked fine when I stuck it to the inside of the windscreen to get this driving shot. But when I stuck it to the top of the car, it fell off after about three minutes. Luckily, it fell into the car. So yeah, don't stick it where you won't see it fall off if it does, because it's not that secure. Okay, back to the case. The first day I just took the camera without the case. This was not a success. You'll not be surprised to learn that the battery in this pint-sized camera does not last a very long time. I think I managed less than 20 minutes of footage before it conked out completely. Also, Without the case, you're limited to shooting in whatever modes you've chosen beforehand. The camera itself has one button. Well, the whole front is a button, really. When you connect the camera to your smartphone in the case using the Insta360 app, you can choose what it does if you click it or double click it, and you can have separate settings depending on whether the camera is on or off too. That was all too confusing for me, so I just set the camera to record in maximum resolution for a single click, like that, and to do a speed up time shift for a double click. The button is a little bit awkward. It's easy to click it by mistake when you're wrestling it out of one of the magnetic mounts. It vibrates to let you know you've clicked it, but you don't always feel it, especially when you're on the bike. A few times I accidentally picked it up and turned it on to do some handheld stuff and then turned it off again when I thought I was turning it on. You can set the camera to stop recording after a set time, so at least you don't run the battery down recording the inside of your pocket for half an hour. 
day two onwards, I took the case with me, which means, as you can see, the camera isn't really any smaller than a GoPro. Unless you have a short day to film and you've got it set up to do all the things you might need to, uh, you want to take the case with you. You can access all the settings and the shooting modes from the case, although it's still a bit of a fiddle, and you get a more positive record button down here. The case also doubles as a neat little tripod, which I have to say, I never used. Uh, the case isn't waterproof, but the camera itself is, which means that jumping in the pool with it isn't as bad of an idea as actually jumping in the pool was an unheated pool in the middle of winter. The little screen shows you the shooting mode and the battery level and also how much space you have left. The camera has 32 gigabytes of memory. There's no option to extend it. So when you're shooting at 2.7K at 50 frames per second, that's less than an hour of footage. And a couple of times I forgot to free up space and run out halfway through the next day. Now you can manage the files on the camera using Insta360's app. And a lot of the messaging around the camera suggests they expect a lot of users to work that way on their phone. Like I said earlier, you'll need to process them one way or another. And the two options are basically the smartphone or a desktop app. You can also edit directly in Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro, but the vast majority of folks won't be doing that. Whichever path you choose, you can play around with the aspect ratio, so you can have the final video in landscape or square or portrait from the same source file. Uh, you can change the camera's angle of view. Uh, you can add effects like the time shift. You can crop the video. You can change the stabilization settings. Changing the stabilization settings is a particular favorite feature of mine because you can either set the stabilization to keep the horizon level, which is great for general shooting, or you can set it in FPV mode where it stabilizes the footage but keeps the lean, which is brilliant for on-bike POV stuff, especially if you speed it up as well. In terms of post-processing, yes, it's a bit of a pain that you have to do it for everything, but it's pretty powerful once you get the hang of it. The desktop app is miles better than the smartphone app for two reasons. Firstly, it's just quicker and easier to use. You can transfer the files uh, to the computer with the USB-C cable that comes with the camera, and then you can play around with them to your heart's content and export multiple versions of the same file without ever losing the original. If you're doing it on your phone, then exporting the files takes ages. And once you've done it, you only have the process file on your phone, you don't have the original. So if you then format the camera for the next day, you're stuck with the edit you chose. Unless you do multiple edits, which you take all night and use up all your phone storage. In one week of riding, I generated about 100 gigabytes of raw footage. And the one time I tried to edit all the files from a day's riding on my phone, I nearly cried. Don't do that. Take your laptop. Anyway, on the whole, the GoTo is a likeable camera. The picture is good, and providing you're willing to invest some time into processing your footage, you get a lot of options for making video for different devices, which makes it really good for making videos for your phone, even if making videos on your phone is maybe less of a strong point, given the limitations of most phones in terms of processing and storage. Nearly everything is a positive and a negative, really. The miniature camera is really fun to use and it's really easy to carry around, but you're limited with how much you can record, both in terms of time and storage and what shooting modes you have access to as well. The single button that's effectively the whole case makes it super simple to turn on, but a proper physical button would lead to less phantom recording. And then the case is a clever way to add all the extra functionality, but it's not waterproof and it's still a bit fiddly. The various mounting options that you get give you a great range of ways to use the camera. Not all of them work quite as well as I'd like. Overall for cycling, I'd say it was more hit than miss, especially if you're committed to editing your videos rather than you know, just slapping them on YouTube as they fall out of the camera. But it can definitely be improved for the next version. So there you go. That is my experience of using the Insta360 Go 2. I hope you found it useful. Ask any questions below in the comments and I'll try and help you out. Don't forget to hit the like button if you've enjoyed this vid as it really helps the channel. We'll see you soon.